welcome to today's episode of Daily Debrief. Now let's go into our first story. In a major development coming out of Brazil, a congressional panel is set to recommend the President Jair Bolsonaro be charged with crimes against humanity, charging that he intentionally let the pandemic spread through the country, which led to the deaths of over 600,000 Brazilians. From the very start of the pandemic, President Bolsonaro took an extremely anti-scientific approach to the virus. He minimized its threat and encouraged mass gatherings. He also peddled a number of treatments that had no basis in science and even discouraged masks. His record has been similar to the vaccination front as well. Excerpts leaked from this 200 pages long report to the media indicates that the panel wants Mr. Bolsonaro to face nine charges. Let's get in some more details on this report. Thank you so much, Swastika. We're joined by Zoe. Zoe, this news is quite big. A lot of people have been talking about uh, how Bolsonaro's approach has been disastrous for Brazil. You've written about it extensively yourself. Could you maybe take us through a bit more detail about how exactly these constitute crimes of humanity? What has been Bolsonaro's approach and what is the impact it has had? Yeah, <clears throat> well, Brazil is, of course, one of the countries that has the highest number of recorded cases of COVID-19 in the world one of the highest number of deaths in the world. Um, and uh, many believe that this was uh, in large part avoidable, but that it, and it is largely due to the approach that Bolsonaro um, took throughout the pandemic. As we know, in these uh, days today, in the coming days, um, the Commission of Parliamentary Invest Inquiry uh, is finalizing their report, which was looking into Bolsonaro's conduct throughout the pandemic because you know, of course, it raised eyebrows across the world, but within Brazil, there was also a lot of um, pushback to his approach. And now talking more concretely about what happened throughout the pandemic, um, you know, in the first couple of days uh, that the pandemic began and, you know, uh, in, in Brazil with the first couple of cases, people were extremely alarmed. They were seeing, uh, you know, confused about what was happening, news across the world. And Bolsonaro, you know, went out, uh, on national TV and said, this is nothing to worry about. It is just a little cold. And, you know, like myself, I'm an athlete, so I have nothing to worry about. And so, you know, from the first moment of the pandemic, he was already sharing misinformation. And, you know, it's not, it's important to note that not only <clears throat> rhetorically was he telling the Brazilian people, uh, this is nothing to worry about, go about your business you know, don't uh, quarantine, but also his policies that uh, he was putting in place on a federal level. And then also, you know, entering into conflict with states across Brazil that were trying to take a more aggressive approach. So we can look at, for example, um, calling uh, for states to not mandate quarantines, calling for them to lift lockdowns and saying that this was actually legal. And so in many cases, we saw states realizing that the federal government was kind of abandoning them and taking an anti-scientific approach, they said, okay, well, at least in our state, we're going to put in me measures in place. And Bolsonaro entered into open conflict with them, institutional conflict, you know, over resources, over many things. Then, of course, on the case, um, on the theme of uh, medicine and treatment of COVID-19, uh, Bolsonaro has, you know, not stopped promoting um, approaches to treat COVID-19 that have been proven to not work and that have actually caused damage. And many people believing that this was the correct, uh, you know, treatment to use have, you know, this has also caused uh, lives to be lost. And then finally, I think on the issue of vaccines, he has been basically completely uh, anti-vaccine and he's not vaccinated himself. Many members of his cabinet are not vaccinated. One of them even got COVID-19 while at the UN General Assembly in New York. Um, and he has also actively blocked uh, vaccine patents uh, in Brazil that have a very robust scientific and uh, biological uh, you know, research within the country that they've been able to produce vaccines at home, but he's actually blocked in many cases these laboratories from be able, being able to produce vaccines and of course then advancing in the vaccination process of the Brazilian people. Right, Zoe. In fact, uh, one interesting bit of information which came out is that uh parliamentary panel was actually considering uh, in, you know, indicting him for cry genocide against the indigenous people as well. But finally, they seem to have not taken that path and those words have been dropped. So could you also talk about how his policies have especially affected the indigenous communities in Brazil? 
Yes, I mean, it's a really horrible in many fronts because not only um, has his policies towards the indigenous communities with regard to COVID, um, not providing enough support, not providing, uh, you know, for example, medical uh, staff, medical healthcare workers. Um, at the beginning of Bolsonaro's presidency, he also uh, forced Cuban doctors to leave the country. A lot of these doctors were serving in places underserved, like for example, where indigenous communities lie. So it's an extremely underserviced area with less access to healthcare, um, you know, much less access to, for example, necessary treatment, um, necessary PPE, and also information about what was happening. And so there was, a, throughout the pandemic, there have been, you know, disturbingly high numbers of the COVID-19 pandemic hitting these communities, but also at the same time, uh, not only with his actions with regard to COVID, but throughout his presidency, he's been pushing anti-Indigenous policies by uh, dismantling, for example, um, different institutions in the government that specifically work on the issue of Indigenous people. Uh, he has, you know, promoted laws and supported laws that would uh, strip Indigenous people of their land and of their ancestral rights. And so all of these attacks against Indigenous communities in a very, very crucial moment, in addition, of course, necessary to add the attacks on the environment, which of course, attack all of uh, all of Brazil, but especially communities that are living in more rural regions um, that are being affected by uh, the forest fires and the constant deforestation happening. Um, and so all of these attacks have been extremely uh, challenging for these communities. And I think especially this has really come to a head with uh, the managing the COVID-19 pandemic. As you mentioned, they ended up not pushing for the crime of genocide. This isn't really surprising, um, you know, throughout Bolsonaro's presidency and specifically throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been all over a hundred requests for his impeachment. And all of these have been blocked because he does have a significant uh, block of support within parliament that has essentially been able to um, stop many key things from happening. Um, and so, uh, you know, stopping the impeachment motion from actually being brought to the floor. And then in this case, uh, while this, uh, the parliamentary inquiry committee is, of course, a smaller group, uh, there was there were uh, key supporters of Bolsonaro that were able to um, block this uh, charge from being actually brought to the table. Right. Thank you so much, Zoe. We'll be following this as with you. And back to you, Swastika. We now head to Iran and the nuclear deal talks between the country and the signatories of the nuclear deal. The talks in Vienna have not resumed after six rounds following the election of Ibrahim Raisi in June. Iran said that it wanted to review the outcome of the rounds held so far. Raisi, like his predecessor, Hassan Rouhani, maintains that all steps taken by Iran following the sanctions are reversible, provided the US lifts all its sanctions and returns to the deal. The Biden administration has refused to lift all the sanctions, despite expressing its desire to return to the deal. We have Prashant with us in our studio. And Prashant, hi, welcome. Actually, Prashant, so what is happening in the talks that are taking place in Vienna? Right, uh, there's right now a sense of, uh, you know, uh, a general sense of confusion, if you can say so, because like you said, the talks haven't resumed since uh, Ibrahim Raisi became the president of Iran. Now, in the Western media, he's portrayed as a hardliner, as an extremist, and, you know, somebody who's blocking these talks. Now, the exact position of Raisi regarding the Iran nuclear deal or the JCPOA, as it is known, is a different matter. But the point, of course, is that Iran's points are quite valid, which is that the nuclear deal or the JCPOA, which was signed in 2015, went into a crisis because in 2018, Donald Trump and the United States withdrew from okay. the deal, right? Yeah. So after that, the deal was effectively uh, in a crisis. And according to the deal, once it, the US withdrew, Iran had the right to take certain steps. Hmm. For instance, increase its enrichment of uranium, for instance, okay. which it had the right under the agreement and it chose to do so. Now, uh, Iran has continuously said, like you pointed out, that it will reverse all these steps once the US comes back into the deal and withdraws all its sanctions, which was the condition for the deal in the first place. Now, the United, this seems a straightforward question because yeah. all everyone accepts. In fact, the Joe Biden administration also is believed to want to come back to the deal. But they don't want to, and we'll discuss that later, of course, but they haven't so far. So there's been this whole detailed round of talks happening in Vienna where all the major countries, that's Russia, China, France, Germany, and the UK on the one hand, 
and Iran have been having discussions. Yeah. And in parallel, there have been discussions with uh, the United States, not directly, right? Mm. So these discussions have been going on for quite some time. And the whole question is on how the US can come back to the deal and how the deal can sort of be reinvigorated again. Now, the important thing here to note is that, uh, like you said, uh, since the Vienna talks was uh, stalled, there have been backroom channels going on. Okay. So last week, a top European Union diplomat went to Tehran, had discussions, said that this Thursday there would be further discussions not in Vienna but in Brussels, okay. where they would discuss going back to the discussions. Now, unfortunately, what has happened is that, which, which is a positive development because mm -hmm. everyone wants talks, right? Yeah. It's a positive development. But on the other hand, what has happened now is that uh, suddenly they walked back. Now, it's an open question whether it was US pressure which led to that because within two days, the European Union kind of changed its stance. The United States also said that these talks in Brussels are not necessary. Mm. So, it's a bit unclear as to why exactly this transpired, why uh, a, a you know, second round of talks which could have led to the other one resuming got stalled. The Iranians seem to have been looking forward to it, but it's not happening. So, that's really where we are right now. The key question, uh, unfortunately, here is that all this is creating a sense of tension is creating a sense whereby uh, some of these Western powers are feeling like they have the justification to say that, hey, we tried talking, now let's impose for faster sanctions, right? So that's really the threat that we're facing right now. In fact, um uh, you, we almost got to the part, why is USA not looking to lift the san uh, sanctions? Because as you said, everybody's ready to talk and willing to negotiate. But what is stopping USA to lift the sanctions? Good question. Because uh, the issue here fundamentally is that it goes back to the question of why Trump and the United States withdrew in 2018 from the deal. Mm. And that's a very simple thing, of course, influenced by Israel because of the close connections between the United States and Israel. Uh, what happened was that there is one section of the US establishment which believes that this deal was too lenient mm. or it was too soft on Iran. So they want to impose actually more harsher restrictions on Iran. For instance, the deal was really only about Iran's nuclear program. Now, Iran has always said that it doesn't want to develop nuclear weapons. But nonetheless, the deal imposed very str fairly strong restrictions on Iran's nuclear program. Iran was fine with it, as long as the old sanctions were withdrawn. Hmm. Right. Now, what the US wants is they want further restrictions on missile, Iran's missiles program, for instance, which was never part of the original deal. Yeah. Or they want restrictions on Iran's involvement in the region. Now, as we talked about in yesterday and in previous episodes, Iran has close connections with groups like Hezbollah. It has close associations with countries like Syria, with the Houthis in Yemen. So, it, uh, the US and Israel don't want Iran to be a strategic player in the region. Mm -hmm. That's really what it boils down to. And they want to use this deal to sort of, at least that was the idea of Trump, that they wanted to use this deal to push this agenda of imposing further restrictions on Iran. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, that's really the game plan here. Now, one very dangerous thing which has happened just, uh, I believe, yesterday, a media report which has come out, which has said that Israel is planning to allocate $1.5 billion for a strike on Iran's nuclear facilities. Mm. Now, this is very, very dangerous news because this comes on the back of, uh, you know, increasingly threatening statements, not only by Israel, but even by the US. In fact, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken had said some days ago that if the talks didn't work out, we would, create, we would look at a third option. Now, okay. is, this, is, 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 yeah, is this military is really the question. Will it be a blank check for Israel to do something of this sort? In which case, the, the, it's going to be catastrophic because, you know, there are so many countries, millions of people. The area, the whole region is one of the hubs of oil supply across the world. If there is any kind of military conflict, what's going to happen is whole scale destruction. So yeah. that's a really, really dangerous possibility. So the real question here is, which is, which is really what Raisi's question President Ibrahim Raisi's question of Iran is that if you want to come back to the deal and the US supposedly wants to, why don't you just lift the sanctions and every, everything is back? That's a simple demand. Mm. So if the Iranians in some ways are probably justified in wanting to review the deal because in the discussions because they feel that, you know, there's not been much progress. But right now it's a bit of a tense situation, one must say, because uh, there is this possibility that not, not only the US and Israel but also the European countries might suddenly decide to say, you know, we tried giving talks a chance, it didn't work, let's go for harsher sanctions, let's, you know, let's stand by while Israel does something. Anything on those lines could be extremely dangerous. So, really, I think the time now is for further discussions. And the important thing to note is that I think concessions have to be made. Iran has made its set of concessions. So, the concessions have to be made by the West, really. We know that the European countries didn't do much when the sanctions were imposed when Trump left the deal. So, 
it's I think the really the ball is in the court of the West. Yeah, let's see which which way USA now turns in terms of sitting on the negotiations. Right, absolutely. Thank you so much, Prashant, for joining us. Let's get into our next story. Now, earlier this week, Ecuador's president, Guillermo Lasso, announced a 60-day state of emergency, which will allow the army to directly patrol the streets throughout the country. Now, according to Lasso, the main objective of this policy will be to dismantle drug trafficking groups and mobs responsible for an increase in violence. This decision occurs amid massive protests against the increase in fuel prices in Ecuador. The state of emergency gives authorities the power to restrict freedom of movement, assembly and association. Now, Lasso has been facing criticism over corruption charges that were revealed in the leaked Pandora Papers, which we had discussed a few days ago on our show. Let's go and talk to Zoya, our correspondent, to get more details on this development in Ecuador. Um, Ecuadorian President Guillermo Lasso announced that he was decreeing a state of emergency across national territory for 60 days. Um, he is ordering that the Ecuadorian armed forces take to the streets uh, and carry out um, controls, inspections, and other types of control mechanisms, uh, allegedly to combat um, drug trafficking and insecurity, which he says is increasing in the country. Um, it is true that the number of homicides recorded in Ecuador has reached a record high in recent months. However, many in Ecuador are hesitant about this uh, measure um, due to the fact that it does violate some of the basic rights of the Ecuadorian people and sets a dangerous precedent of the militarization of Ecuadorian streets. And uh, in this decree, Guillermo Lasso also mentioned that he would be giving specific measures uh, to make sure that police and military carrying out these measures would not be met um, with any sort of a legal uh, issues or um, or demands and charges uh, brought against them. Um, many have also speculated that this um, that this decree is also given in response to the several waves of protests that have been happening in Ecuador. Um, there was a protest of transportation workers, also of uh, peasants and agricultural workers. Um, and so many are quite concerned with this decree. Um, also, uh, two weeks back, as we have reported on People's Dispatch and also on Daily Debrief, um, Guillermo Lasso was uh, coming under fire uh, justifiably from not only the, um, the people of Ecuador, but also within the Legislative Assembly, uh, because he is accused of having offshore holdings, which were revealed as part of the Pandora Papers. Um, and so this response of, you know, militarization of national territory, of you know, an increase in some senses of, you know, instigating fear within the people, constant uh, revisions of cars, of looking for drugs, looking for weapons. Um, people also see this as a fear mechanism to come to try to uh, placate the people in a moment of, you know, confusion and a moment of feeling angry with the government for the measures that it has taken. Um, and so, you know, within the coming days, we will see how this uh, how this decree is going to develop. What will be the response of the people? As of now, uh, it will be starting now for 60 days, armed forces on the streets and special forces carrying out this decree by Guillermo Lasso. And finally, in our last section, Queen Elizabeth II of Britain, who is now 95 years old, was offered the title of Oldie of the Year by a British publication. She's declined the award, saying, you're only as old as you feel. Queen Elizabeth II is the longest serving British monarch in history, with her reign spanning almost seven decades. Now let's get in back to Prashant and talk to him about what do you make of, um, of the fact that there is a reign, such a long reigning monarch? And in fact, there is this institution itself. Good question, Swastika. The, for me, the real question is less about the monarch. I mean, I'm all for Queen Elizabeth's spirit, to, uh, spirit in terms of what's old and what's, you know, feeling as old as you are or whatever. But the important thing is really the question of monarchy. And I yeah. think it's uh, strange to imagine that this institution continues in any part of the world to this day. Yeah. Just a few days ago on the show, we talked about Swaziland, an absolute monarch and the havoc he's wreaked across uh, his country, the 
number of people who have died, etc., etc. Now, of course, uh, in Britain, in Europe, in many other parts of the world where monarchs still rule, Thailand, another example, yeah. where a monarch is causing havoc. Of course, in Britain, it's far more, it's not as bloody maybe, uh, but still, it's very expensive. Uh, the costs range uh, anywhere between 64 million to th about 340 million annually of British pounds, basically. So, uh, really, the question is why are monarchies still a thing in today's uh, time and age is really the question. Uh, people across the world have moved on to elected systems. Monarchy brings with it a very uh, this sense of being not accountable. You know, so that's yeah. uh, it's, it's it's a popular institution in Britain uh, apparently by polls and all that, but. The real question is that the, monar the monarchy is a very, anywhere in the world is an unaccountable institution. You know, the monarch still has some, uh, some amount of influence in government, it continues to this day. The family of the monarch, a lot of, a lot of mess in recent times. We have seen Prince Andrew who was involved apparently with Jeffrey Epstein and there's a lot, huge mess over there. We have seen the controversy around uh, her grandchildren. But beyond all that, I mean, those those are maybe the stuff of tabloids or whatever. Yeah, stories you get yeah, but, but beyond all that, the larger question is of the cost of an institution, yes. the lack of accountability of the institution, and what it kind of prevents or restricts in terms of there being one more democratic space, because that is what a head of state is elected, a elected head of state is, whether it be a direct, a powerful president, or in the case of a country like India, where they're more of a figurehead. But nonetheless, it is a sign of, you know, democracy progressing to the next level. So. I, I think that, I mean, like I said, irrespective of uh, whether Queen Elizabeth is old or not, the monarchy is definitely too old for today's time. That's true. That should get the Oldie of the Year award. Absolutely. Oh, I don't know it should be an award though. <laughs> no, yeah, it shouldn't be an award. <laughs> right. Thank you, Prashant. And that's all we have for you today. Keep following People's Dispatch and come back to our show tomorrow, Daily Debrief.